Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, help us to be still. Help us to hear from you. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears, and our eyes to see what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm sure that reading is very familiar to a lot of you. The two parables about losing things. I wonder, what is it that you've lost in your life recently? Maybe it's something really small. Maybe it's something really big. I know for one that I get quite frustrated when I lose things. I usually say to Amanda, well, where was the last place it was? She says, well, if you knew that, it wouldn't be lost, would it? Of course, as we continue to unpack our house, we're still losing things. We've st- I've lost my headphones, which are in a case about that big. So in a house, I have no idea where they are, how I'm supposed to find them. But we know they're in the house somewhere. Of course, losing some things can also be really good. For me, particularly where the weight goes, I need to lose some. That would be a good thing. Of course, there are small examples of things that can be lost for the good or for bad. But perhaps sometimes we lose things that are much bigger, don't we? We may lose our wallet or our purse and have to ring endless people reporting lost cards, getting a new driving license, perhaps getting a new passport. Have we ever lost our faith? I wonder. I was sharing this week with Steve in the office that when I was confirmed at 14, I then lost my faith and walked away for six years. But obviously I came back, otherwise I wouldn't be stood here today. It may also be that we've lost a family member, a loved one, a friend. And that moment when we're just struck numb. I say all of this because as we know, losing something can have an impact on us in many, many ways. And probably more than we would care to own up to or imagine. Some things that we lose can be found, those material things I mentioned. Some things we lose can't be found again. And we have to adapt to living out our lives differently in that. Well, the reading we had today from Luke 15, we get those two parables about things being lost and found. And if we carry on past verse 10, we'd have had the parable of the prodigal son. I'm sure it's, all, it's well known to all of you. So actually, Luke is giving us three lost and found parables, one after another. And we can learn from them. But why do we get them here, in this particular section? Well, the start of the passage says, doesn't it, the Pharisees and scribes were muttering about Jesus welcoming sinners and eating with them. After all, in Jesus' time, who you ate with reflects your status in society. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law must have been really confused why Jesus kept doing this. It wasn't what they were expecting from him. But Jesus, as we know, has a habit of celebrating and eating with what we could say are the wrong people. And the two parables we hear about today give us an explanation why he does just that with those people. There's a reason to celebrate. Because through these, this passage we had, we get a wide open window on what Jesus is doing and perhaps what we as his followers should be doing. We don't want to be confined to within the walls of our church. We need to be out mixing with people who perhaps have nowhere else to go. We need to be available to meet with them, to share our lives with them. And to look out for them. And from the very outset of the passage, we get an understanding that there will be opposition. The Pharisees and teachers clearly didn't know what Jesus was doing. So before we get into the parables a bit more, I wonder who do you most associate with from that reading this morning? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, I'll ask you. It's between you and the Lord. Do you associate with the sinners sitting round with Jesus, desperate to hear what he's saying, 
desperate to hang on every single word that he says to you? Or are you more like the Pharisees thinking, why is he associating with those people? After all, tax collectors weren't liked in the culture. They were liars and cheats. Nobody cared for them as they were collecting for Herod or the Romans or maybe both. They may too have been unclean as they've been associated with the Gentiles. So who do you most associate with as Jesus speaks? We don't know who the sinners are. They're put in inverted commas. Maybe they were people too poor to understand the law. But what we know is that the self-appointed experts were looking down their nose at them and they weren't being respected. Jesus isn't saying here that they can be accepted as they are. Sinners must repent. As we heard, the lost sheep and the lost coin are found. But Jesus is showing that there's a different understanding The Pharisees and teachers would want the sinners to adopt their standards of purity and law observance. But through the reading, we see that the Pharisees and teachers are also included. In verse 7, righteous people don't need to repent. But they do. Now, these parables are often seen as emphasizing the redemption of the lost, and that's perfectly fine. But today, I want to look at them from the already found perspective in the way that it brings us into into the parable. And firstly, there is, as I read them, I thought, well, there is, in some ways, a threat of coming near. Because in verse 1, in many ways, we actually get a threat. The tax collectors and sinners are coming near. So I wonder, how do you feel when people approach the inner circle? Maybe you felt threatened by somebody at home at work, in church. I'm not saying physically threatened, don't hear me wrong, but maybe as somebody has taken on more responsibility, it's impacted what you do. And you thought, hang on a minute, that's what I do, that's my job. It often can leave us feeling quite displaced. And sometimes we can feel hurt, and our feelings of safety can disappear. So how do we react when those things happen? when we feel threatened. Sometimes these things are spoken about really openly. I remember during my first week of curacy, I was sat in my training incumbent study with the lay reader, and she looked at me and said words that I remember to this day. Tim, I feel threatened by you. You're going to take away all that I'm doing and make me useless. I was stumped. I didn't know what to say. But my training incumbent said something like, but that's not the case at all. We're going to work together and use our gifts for the kingdom here in Bentham. And sure enough, as my curiosity progressed, the work I did didn't impact the labor at all. I later found out that her thought behind those words were because her, she thought her calling as a reader was simply to lead and preach. But of course, this isn't the case. She'd only been a reader about six months. So we worked together, and we saw that actually, the lay reader's calling was very different to what I was doing. My work seemed to be focused mainly with the families and the children in Bentham, doing the youth cafe, doing, what else was it, families at four, a messy church. But the lay reader's calling was much more with the people who were on their own. And she actually became a dementia friend and helped those in the, with, with dementia and their carers. So actually, we complemented each other. But initially, she felt threatened. I also set up um, seeing one lady taking home communion. And it's really reassuring to know that the lay reader is actually continuing that ministry. Now I've moved on. To her, the initial impact was that she felt threatened. She didn't want the status quo to be affected. Now, please don't feel that I'm giving her a really bad press, because I'm really not. You know, Amanda and I will tell you, we both got on really, really well with her. We were in the same house group. We supported each other in ministry. But I'm using this just to make the point that sometimes, when things change, people feel threatened. 
I wonder if this is generally why people don't like change, because it affects the status quo. We start to feel threatened. I don't know if you've seen the cartoon that's gone round on Facebook recently. Who wants to change? And everybody's hand goes up. Are you ready to change? Everybody's hand goes down. We know it needs to happen. We know that life moves on, church moves on, jobs move on, that change is an inevitable part of life. But sometimes we're too afraid to say, it has to happen now. Well, Jesus knows this too. And I think that's why these two parables are told as they are. After all, Jesus is the masterful storyteller. He reminds us that we welcome in those who are lost. And if heaven is partying when someone comes into the fold, we should be partying here on earth when that happens. We shouldn't look at people differently or judge them, but simply welcome them in. And I've heard this week, again, that when people come into Christ church, we welcome them. You welcome them. And that's exactly what Jesus is asking us to do. Welcome those who come in. Don't feel threatened as things change. It's inevitable. But maybe it's God saying to you, You've, that's your season. I'm going to send you to something else. The talk of welcoming. There is a difference between welcoming and saving. At the heart of these two parables, it's stories of searching and finding. What's the search for? Well, in each case, it's very specific. It's a wandering sheep, and it's a lost coin. And there's joyfulness to find in the lost sheep, the one who's wandered far and now returns home. And I'm sure we can all relate to when God seeks us out, when he found us, when he brought us home. We all have testimonies in our lives when times have been tough and God has seen us through. As I mentioned earlier, I walked away from church in my teenage years. And it wasn't until university when I came back. And that was through a combination of the university chaplain and an alpha course. That's my story of how when I was lost, God found me. I wonder, what's your story? Have you been lost? Has God found you? But the difference is in welcoming and saving it's often easier for us as Christians to search out those who need saving. We walk alongside people and we long to see them come to the living relationship with the Lord. How do we feel about welcoming those who are lost? I read this week that saving is about power, whereas welcoming is about intimacy. Saving is about power. Welcoming is about in intimacy. Saving is focused on the individual, but welcoming is focused on the community. Of course, saving is an individual thing. It's something that happens between you and God, between a person and God. Of course, we walk alongside them. We can help people. We answer their questions. We help them understand who God is. Indeed, it's one of the privileges of being a Christian that we walk alongside people. One of the privileges for Amanda and I in Curacy was we walked alongside a mum and her little boy who both came to faith. Her little boy became a Christian first. He was five at the time. And through that, his mum did. And I remember at the midnight service last year that this mum was completely overwhelmed at the end of the service. And I remember her sitting on the steps and just saying, wow, Jesus was born as a man. And that really struck me. I thought, that's the faith I want. The simple faith, knowing that Jesus was born for me and for you. Of course, we all have our own stories. Those whom are lost and now are found. But ultimately... The saving is done by God himself. But the welcoming, that's focused on the community. It's something that us as the people of God have to do. 
We all know it takes a lot of courage stepping into a church. Half of the battle is getting people through the very doors. And one thing I've noticed this last week being in the office is just how well you do that here. That there are so many people coming through the doors. It fills my heart with joy. Because that, friends, is half the battle. As someone crosses the threshold into the building, that's when the welcome becomes important. If they get the cold shoulder, chances are they're not going to come back. But if they come in, they see friendly faces, they get, hi, nice to see you, my name's so-and-so. Would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a cup of coffee? You know, as the service starts, if they're outside, would you like to come through, would you like to sit with me? It's all those sort of things that we can do to welcome people. We don't want to stop anyone coming through those doors. We want to be flinging them wide open and welcoming everybody. And those small things can have a lasting impact. To go and say hello and welcome to someone can have that impact. And it's sometimes through that simple welcome that we can see people start to explore what faith is. At one of my churches in Curacy, we had a chap who used to scare the residents of the village. He would hide in bushes and jump out of them just to see how loudly they screamed. <laughs> People were then afraid of him. I remember once walking out of the community center and seeing him dressed in one of those spandex bodysuits and thinking, what on earth? But that's the sort of thing that he used to do, and he used to feed off that. He'd always be going around asking people for money, for food, for drink. And I mean drink in the sense of, you know, just soft drinks, not, not alcohol. Gradually, he started hanging around with a couple of people who used to sit in the porch of this particular church. They would drink alcohol. Sadly, one of them died from alcohol poisoning. But this chap started meeting with these people in the church porch because he felt it was a safe space. And gradually, each time we would arrive, we would welcome him into church, but he wouldn't come through the doors. But eventually, something changed, and he started coming in to the church. And over time, he started to ask us questions, really deep questions on occasions. He came on the Alpha course we ran last year. He started attending our prayer meetings. He read the Bible. I don't know whether he's yet given his life to Christ, but it was clear just seeing the transformation that the Holy Spirit was working in him. Residents were no longer afraid. He used to stop jumping out at them. They would actually say, oh, he's at church. And that then impacted the community by people saying, that church is welcoming. And that's the sort of reputation we need as a church. And that's the sort of reputation I feel you already have from the things I've picked up in the last 10 days. Because we welcome people in. We welcome those who are lost. We welcome them without condition. That's what Jesus does. That's what we should do. And we show them through our actions that God loves them. We welcome those into the fold. Of course, sometimes there is a search to do that. But then there is the joyful find. So I want to turn that. There's a diligent search and there's a joyful find. Because after all, in the two parables, we hear, don't we, the shepherd and the woman were diligently searching for what is lost. And that can sometimes mean going the extra mile. It can sometimes mean going into dark places, into places that we've sealed off, that we don't want to go to again. Maybe physically, maybe within ourselves, maybe there's parts of us where we've turned that part of us away from God. I sometimes think of it as going into the closet and finding the skeletons. Those ones that we've buried that perhaps we think we can leave there. But eventually we find we can't because God wants to deal with them. There's things I've done that I'm not proud of that I want to hide away. There's things I've done that I've tried to hide in the closet. But sure enough, God has said, they're not staying there. You need to deal with them. And through, through college, through curacy, I've been dealing with those. I'm not saying I'm perfect and I'm sorted because I'm not, believe me, I'm not. But I wonder, what things have you perhaps put away and said, well, I don't want God to go there. 
Well, friends, let me tell you, God wants to go there. God wants to go to those very deep places, those places of hurt. He wants to go there. And I encourage you to allow him. It's those moments when the Holy Spirit brings something to the surface. We realize that we can't hold it in anymore. And it can and often is very painful. And as those things that go really deep are brought up, we can often find ourselves feeling vulnerable. And they can come upon us when we least expect it. And that can sometimes have an impact on the way that we welcome, on the way that we search, because we cast our own anxieties onto the other person. So I encourage you to be open to the Holy Spirit, to allow him to go into those deep, deep places. Because God loves each and every one of us so much that we can't stay the way that we are. Sometimes those things that we hide stop us from progressing. And we have to have the maturity to acknowledge those things before God and seek his help in dealing with them. And the Holy Spirit will help us deal with them when the time's right. When it's right for those to come to the surface, you will know. And often when we've done that and acknowledged it, we feel lighter in ourselves. So the diligent search for what is lost can be uncomfortable. It will probably challenge us. And it will challenge what we hold dear. But as we search, I encourage you to do it joyfully. Don't think, I've got to do this. Think, I want to do this. I want the Lord to find what's holding me back. I want the Lord to save my brother, my sister, my brother-in-law, my mum, my dad, my child. Do it joyfully, because that's what the Lord wants us to do. In these parables, we hear Jesus speaking with joy. He doesn't just emphasize it, though, in his words. He expects rejoicing. As after all, when we've done something joyful, we rejoice. And as we rejoice, it is an expression of that true joy where everyone is included. If we've lost something, we do usually rejoice when it's found, don't we? And it's no different with God. As we see those people come to faith, as we see those parts of our lives come to the surface and are dealt with heaven rejoices and we rejoice with heaven so the search can be painful but it's worth it the shepherd rejoices when the sheep is found the woman rejoices when the coin is found but they don't do it on their own they call their friends and neighbors together and they rejoice together as a community And it again brings us back to community. That as a community, we welcome and we share with one another. It reminds me of Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. And that's what we do as a community. We come together to help each other through difficult times. We come together when people are searching. When the search is complete and the lost is found we rejoice with one another it's right there in Luke call your friends and neighbors rejoice with them if there's a party let's all join in let's all have a party together as heaven meets earth in the two parables the particular sheep and the particular coin I'm sure weren't in themselves special Of course, it had been special to the shepherd and to the woman. But ultimately, we're not focused on those specific things. The point of the parable is that the only thing different about the sheep and the coin was that they were lost, and then they were found. So as we consider these two parables, both very well known, I wonder, what's the Lord saying to you this morning through those two parables? Who is it that you long to be found? Who is it that you long to see saved? What part of your life has been lost 
that needs to be found? Where do you need to return to the Lord and say, I'm ready to deal with this? Where do you need to make a diligent search? Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you in that search and he will show you what you need to bring to the surface. I wonder, do you feel threatened when someone new comes into the fold? How do you react to that? As we move forward as a church and as we discover what God is calling us to do, I'm sure we will inevitably at, all, at some point feel threatened because things might change. Things may be different. That's not how we used to do it. I don't know where those changes are going to be. I don't know how you're going to feel as, as we move forward, as we see and seek what God is do, wanting to do here in Christ church. But we will trust that the Lord will guide us. That he will guide us when we have to make painful decisions. When we have to make small decisions, the Lord will be in that. How well do we welcome people into the fold? Well, from my perspective, I know that your welcome for Amanda and I has been absolutely fantastic. And again, I just say thank you. I know how welcomed the group of people from the Ingleborough team were when they came down. And you welcomed them with open arms and said, welcome, come into our church. My stepdad and friends who stayed last Sunday said again how welcome you'd made them feel. So it's clear that we are a welcoming church. The people encounter the love of God as they walk through the door. And every day this last week as I've walked into church, there's a real sense of God being present in all that we do. As we walked in this morning, I sensed God saying, I'm here, I'm with you. And then the words that came at the start of the service and during the service, it is that sense of, let's be still. Let's be silent. Let's listen to the Lord. I'm really bad at that. In curiosity, I got really, really bad. And it got to the point where my training company said, you're not spending enough time with God. So I'm determined as I start setting these new routines to not fall into that trap again. Find time for the Lord in your lives and everything else will fall into place. Seek God first and everything else will fall into place. Spend time with God, with his word, with scripture, read scripture, pray. Everything else will fall into place. So I wonder, what is the Lord asking of you today? Is he saying, my child, my daughter, my, my, my son, sorry, I got confused there. My daughter, my son. I want to spend time with you. I long to be with you. Give me some space. Give me some time. What part of you is lost that needs finding? Who in your circle of family and friends is lost and needs finding? How can we rejoice together when those things are found? I wonder this morning if there is a sense of something bubbling within you that you think, actually, I need to deal with that. I need to respond to that. Then I'd love to pray with you. I would love to pray with you. You don't have to tell me what it is. I know there's one or two others that are willing to pray as well. But I encourage you to seek us out. Come forward and seek us out. I'm sure the worship band will play um, the, next, the next song, but do come forward and, pr and receive prayer. Don't leave this place thinking, I wish I'd dealt with that. Because chances are, it's the Holy Spirit stirring something up within you. So I encourage you, don't leave this place without having received prayer. If you don't want to come to the front, that's fine. Find one of us at the end of the service. And we'll, go, we'll pray somewhere, somewhere else, either in here or out there. But do business with God this morning. And I think the first step to that is by leaving some space. Let's leave some silence for God to speak to us. And if you're uncomfortable with silence, just I encourage you, just try and relax into it and go with it. Listen for that still small voice of Jesus. 
And then we can rejoice together as a community, as family. Speak to us, Lord. We, your servants, are listening. 